welcome to the Transforming Trauma podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. We're so excited to share the power of healing from complex trauma with all of you. It's inspiring to know that so many of you tune in to learn about how healing from complex trauma is possible. Are you interested in deepening your understanding of NARM? We're excited to present The Inner Circle, NARM's online learning community. Each month, members receive direct mentorship from NARM creator, Dr. Lawrence Heller, NARM training director, Brad Kammer, and other NARM faculty as they present NARM demonstration sessions and provide extensive debriefs on applying NARM with real clients. They also present live topic webinars that deconstruct the various elements of complex trauma. Members also get access to archived material and other learning resources, as well as access to a private Facebook group with other professionals learning NARM around the world. The Inner Circle is a hub for the international NARM community where people working with complex trauma come together to connect, network, and develop trauma-informed projects to help our world. You, our Transforming Trauma listeners, can receive a free 14-day trial with access to the three-month archive by visiting www.narmtraining.com forward slash free trial. And now for our interview. Dr. Stephen Gilligan is a therapist, author, and teacher. After receiving his doctorate in psychology from Stanford University and motivated by his life experiences, he developed a new practice incorporating Ericksonian psychotherapy, Aikido, Buddhism, meditation, and the performance arts. His work focuses on the awakening of soul, drawing parallels from other traditions where this is seen as essential to the awakening of the human spirit. Dr. Stephen Gilligan lives in California, is married, and is a devoted student of Aikido. He is the author of several books in the field, as well as many papers on hypnosis, hypnotherapy, and the works of Erickson. Please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Stephen Gilligan. All right, I'm sitting here with Dr. Stephen Gilligan. Steve, thanks so much for coming on Transforming Trauma. You're welcome, Emily. Happy to be here. So if you are okay with it, I'd love to start how we often start an arm session, and that is really to ask you what is it that you would like listeners to get out of our conversation today? Well, you know, I am a psychologist. I'm trained as a psychologist. I think the sort of first generation of psychotherapy made a big mistake in terms of primarily emphasizing person's limitations and pathology. I think that psychotherapy is best situated through a focus on a person's resources and what it is that they want to do to move forward in their life. This, you know, gets a little bit complicated with trauma, with complex trauma, with PTSD. But I think nonetheless, that's the important thing. We're trying to use the conversation to help people open a creative path back into life and into a happy future. And I love that you called it a creative path. I think that's the most important principle is creativity. That's what we humans do is creativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you would, can you tell us more about the work that you do in the field? Well, it's been a long, strange trip. You know, I've been in the field for 45 plus years. I did my undergraduate at Santa Cruz, my graduate work in cognitive psychology at Stanford. And when I was an undergraduate at Santa Cruz, I met Dr. Melton Erickson, the legendary psychiatrist and hypnotherapist. So I I started out using a lot of Ericksonian trance work, which is different from your traditional booga booga hypnosis. Mm -hmm. I shifted to more mind-body work around creativity and how to do self-regulation and centering. And so I don't think that I would describe my work in hypnotic terms now. I think it's sort of an irretrievable word in terms of the negative connotation for both the public and professional audience, but really interested in connecting with the many, many different modalities of intelligence people have, again, to bring them all together so they can step out into the world and, and live a great life. You have a really rich background. So you you mentioned Milton Erickson. Can you tell us more about where you started? Well, my undergraduate at uh, UC Santa Cruz was actually in humanistic 
psychology, you know, so it's doing things like, you know, Carl Rogers and Virginia Satir. One of my teachers at Santa Cruz was Gregory Bateson, the sort of famous cybernetician anthropologist. He was a close colleague of Erickson. So when I met Erickson when I was 19, it was like, you know, the universe opened up and this sense of, how should I put it? I knew since I was a little boy that I was going to be a psychotherapist. And I always say, you just have to take one look at my family and know that somebody had to volunteer for the job. And I had this image unconsciously of what does a responsible psychotherapist look like? What, you know, if you want to, something you want to do, what does it look like? Who's a model for that? And I think my model was this sort of American Freud, a, a white male, about 50 years old, looking kind of constipated with a beard and a pipe. And uh, it was sort of uncomfortable just to be in the presence of that image. But nonetheless, I thought, okay, this is reality. This is what you are supposed to be if you're going to grow up. And I met Erickson, and he was like this little Yoda. You know, as a small guy, he, he he was colorblind. So by the time I met him in the last five years of his life, he wore only purple. He was paralyzed a good part of his life from polio. And his message was, your only hope is to be yourself. Your only hope is to realize that the way you know it and the way you do it and the way that you express it has never been seen in the world before. So what's really important is to get to know yourself, no matter how strange you find it yourself or how different you may feel yourself, but it's the alignment with who you are. That's what gives you creative power and happiness. So I think I've been on that journey and obviously the historical experience of each person is really important in terms of how their identity is unfolding. So you guys are a trauma organization that clearly is one of the more significant events that will be a, a significant piece of your identity. So coming to know that and accept that and welcome that ultimately as the basis for your development as a human being is something I think is really, really, really important. Mm, I appreciate you saying that. I don't think I've ever had anyone say, welcome the experience that we've had of trauma. Like that's just been part of it. Like we have to, like, what else would we do? And so many of us resisted it for so long. That's so nice. It's refreshing to hear that perspective. I think that's a major source of where problems are developed is there's something that's there and you're unwilling or unable to welcome it. So for Erickson, he called it the utilization approach, but I would say probably the most common word that you'll hear me use in a therapy session is welcome, welcome. And the way that we usually think about it is it's not some negative it that needs to be gotten rid of, but it's a part of you that needs to be included in the conversation. And the non-welcoming, the negative attack on that part of you is why we're talking about things in the office. Thank you for saying that. And that's really the lens that I hold it as well and that we hold it in NARM. Yeah. So how do you define, like if you were to define complex trauma or trauma, how do you hold that? Well, those are two different terms, aren't they? Trauma yeah. and complex trauma. Right. And the general definition is an event that is so overwhelming that the majority of people could not stay present for it. You know, so if something happens and I, last time I looked, there was like one in two Americans experienced by a very narrow definition of trauma, they experience at least one trauma in their life. A single trauma, I think, is a very different beast, if you will, than a complex trauma. I don't know, you know, in the 1980s, there was a, a big drag down argument in the psychotherapy field about quote unquote false memory. 
Yeah. And it was a time where as therapeutic fads occur, that some therapists were saying everything indicated a trauma. And and they're really overreaching, I believe. I, I think trauma is significantly underreported, but it is possible to suggest trauma where it isn't. So there was this big battle about why, if somebody's traumatized, would they forget it and only remember it decades later? Or would it be like learning theory? My doctorate is in cognitive psychology and learning theory. Would learning theory would say any intense experience, any significant emotional experience is the experience that's most readily remembered. So was it dissociation? Or was it learning theory? And there was a woman, I think she's still around. Uh, she's a psychiatrist. Her name is Lenora Terr, T-E-R-R, -R, in San Francisco. You know, in the 1970s, there was this big national case of these kids who were kidnapped in the desert. And they were kidnapped in a bus. And while the kidnappers, who weren't the brightest bulbs in the room, try to get money, they buried the bus in the desert sand. And the FBI was on it, you know, it was all over the media. And at some point, the sand on the top of the roof collapsed the roof. And most of the kids went into freeze. A couple of the older boys mobilized. One of them got on top of the other's shoulders, pulled all the kids out. And thankfully, all, they all got out before the roof collapsed. And there was a big team, Lenore Terra was the head of the mental health team, to work with these kids. And she did all this uh, memory immediately and at various points thereafter. And she weighed in on this, is trauma forgotten or, or not? And she said, these kids who, who experienced the single trauma, they had very accurate, full memory that maintained itself. It didn't change over time. So that suggests that the learning theory idea that emotional experiences are not repressed is valid. She said, but I have a lot of kids in my practice who have been severely traumatized and they have big gaps in their memory. And so she said, how do you reconcile basically right. single trauma versus complex trauma? And she proposed, and I, I think she's right on, that when you know it's, it's going to happen again. I mean, I grew up in a you know very violent, alcoholic family, and my father was my father was the violent alcoholic, and he would come home at all times of the night. And I remember staying up late at night for his footsteps coming in. Because I could tell by the quality of his footsteps whether he was drunk or not. And if he was drunk, he was going to go after my mom. And so I would jump up and mobilize and distract him. You know. So she said, I think accurately, that people start to use their imagination, their gift of imagination, so that when it happens again, they're not there. That They go to some safe place. And so they don't remember it because they're not really there. And I think this, you know, is one of the things that gives all these additional consequences of trauma if it becomes a lifestyle of dissociation. Yeah. So those scenarios where we as humans know this is going to happen again, this is a pattern, that's how you would define the complex trauma. It's chronic. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're, you're always anticipating, you know, and human beings, we have this sort of open-ended software for representing all these core needs or these core events. You know, I love dogs. Dogs aren't that complex in terms of the way that they think. You know, they're beautiful, they, they're intuitive, they're amazing. But, you know, the way that a dog eats food is not very complicated. There's not that much variety. <laughs> I'd be too coarse, particularly in this conversation, to talk about sexual behavior dogs. 
but it's basically pretty instinctual. Human beings, for every core need, safety, connection, eating, sexuality, body, we have 10,000 different ways that we can represent that. And some of those ways that we represent it really will block us from connecting in any way. And I think those are the PTSD, those are the, the real deleterious effects of complex trauma. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more. You mentioned you know, some of your own personal history and your background, and, and I know you have a really rich kind of way of how you came to doing the work that you do. Could you just talk more about it? I just want to hear more about it, <laughs> how, how you got to doing what you're doing. Well, I went to school with uh, Dominican nuns and Jesuit priests. You know, I was in San Francisco and uh, came of age in the 60s. Right, my high school was right next to the Haight-Ashbury. There you are. <laughs> So th there was a lot going on, but I, I think I always really got into, like, was totally tuned to ritual. I never liked reading the Bible or anything. My mom read it like two hours a day, the New, the New Testament. But I loved to be an altar boy. I loved the sort of community activities that there were these, tra what I later you know came to use as the language of trance-like events and this attunement to non-rational states of being. So from, I think, my religious childhood into sex, drugs, rock and roll, you know, in the late 60s, finding then I was, you know, got into meditation, formally initiated when I was 14. I got into hypnosis as a major therapeutic modality of my early days of 19. So... It seems to me when we're looking at the creative life or the, the sort of the basic life of human beings, this non-rational, deeply experiential mode is the primary mode. And from that, you know, from a therapeutic point of view, one of the main di distinctions is that primary pre-verbal mode, is it positive or negative? Does it have this sense of openness to it where you can safely feel the flow of information and energy through you and be curious about it? You know, I was mentioning before we came on that I have a five-month-old granddaughter who lives with me on the property. My daughter and son-in-law son live with us. And being with a five-month-old baby girl, especially when it's your granddaughter, it's like, wow. She's just in the flow, right? There's no trauma. There's no sort of ego mind that's there. She's in a very safe and secure place. That place is what will allow you to create positive, happy, healthy experiences. Things happen along the way. They're not all as severe as trauma, things like formal education. You know, where we're told paying attention means, you know, your your body gets very stiff and you're just paying attention to trying to memorize things in your verbal brain. But we have so much emotional and social education that begins to shut down that what I would call your center or your core or your creative unconscious. And when that shut down, you can't really do very well creatively because that's your gateway into the universe. That's your gateway into the ancestors. That's your gateway into open creativity. So we call that a coach state, which is an acronym. It means it's centered, open, aware, connected, positively, hospitable, welcome to whatever shows up. And we see that as the base for learning for therapeutic healing and for transformation. The counterpart is what we would call a crash state, again, an acronym, which means constricted, reactive, into analysis paralysis. You know, what does it mean? What do I do? What does it mean? What do I do? Feeling separate and isolated, 
than feeling hurt or hurtful. So those are the states. And I, by the way, I, the, the polyvagal work that's gotten popular in the last five years, I think it's one way to talk about those pre-verbal underlying unconscious states that we could say they're open or closed. And in that closed state, that crash state, I mean, you, you could see me, but if I, if I were to describe, my shoulders are up and my body's really tense and my face is scrunched. If I want to experience something positive and I'm in that somatic state, it's not going to be possible. I think we know that intuitively. So one of the things that happens with PTSD in particular is people unavoidably go into this crash state. I always tell people this was an act of self-love that you dissociated. Mm -hmm. It was an act of self-love that you protected yourself. It worked great as a short-term strategy. It sucks as a long-term strategy. So in that lockdown state, nothing really gets in or out. So you can't feel other people. You can't receive anything positive from the world. You can't let people see you. And if people, people don't feel you and people don't see you, you're going to have a really hard time finding your way in the world. So when we work it with people in therapy, it's really tough because you can't just say, oh, just relax. You know, the, the trauma's over. You know, it's so conditioned in there. You have to work in this place where your somatic nonverbal music is really tuned and your way of supporting and acknowledging everything that's happening as a sign of intelligence. So person is shut down. That's great. So there's a presence inside of you when we begin to talk about this that really shuts down. I'm sure that makes sense. Welcome. You have to be ready to duck because sometimes clients throw pillows at you. You know, if you're telling them <laughs> that the thing that seems to be you know, most blocking them is a resource. But that's really what we're saying. You know, every response you make is a resource. Every response that you make has organismic intelligence. The key thing is whether you, and originally in the first part of your life, it's others, whether they can receive that and give blessing to that or acknowledge that as something that has positive value. You know, so as it comes out, if I come out and I'm a, you know, four-year-old kid and I say, no, I don't want to, and I stamp my foot, that's already a core resource of fierceness or setting boundaries or saying no. Every human being needs that at every point in their life. If when I say I don't want to, I get screamed at or yelled at or hit or ignored, then the social cognitive message that gets layered over that core resource is that part of you is bad. That part of you is not okay. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is so aligned with how I'm thinking of it. And, and Narm, we talk about it as like healthy protest. And every human yeah. on earth healthy needs protest, to be able to ha right. yeah, have a healthy protest. That, that's, yeah. But when we've gotten that message that, oh, anger is bad, this part of you is bad, you've got to shut that down, That that is problematic, right? Yeah, it's problematic. And then you get this sort of secondary set of responses, which if I can't satisfy this core need directly in human connection, I start to outsource. And so things that you see people with PTSD suffer from, withdrawal or increase in drugs or alcohol or numbing or you know eating disorders or stuff like that, those become the sort of the one step removed outsourced ways to satisfy this basic need. So being from an Irish family, I've, I've got a long history in my lineage, particularly the, the male lineage, with alcoholism and depression. And I've done a lot of work out of necessity with it. 
and I can see that the alcohol was a way to create this feeling of gold warmth around my whole being, to just hold me with a pseudo feeling of love. Mm. And everybody has that need. It's a universal need. But again, we humans can understand and express and satisfy a need in virtually an infinite number of ways. So if I can't get that need met directly, you know, to say I need a hug, for example, or I, I just need some support right now. If I come to believe that that's not possible in human relationships, then I start to outsource in all these non-human presences like drugs and alcohol say, hey, over here, I know what you need. And it becomes our way to try to satisfy that need. And if you're an addictive type, all of the value of addiction is front-loaded. First time, it's free. If you're an addict, the first part of it is great. Like, oh, man, I discover when I do this, I feel safe, I feel warm, I feel good, I don't have anxiety. And then you have to realize you have to give a little piece of your soul every time you do the addiction. And so addiction is a pathological liar. It promises you fulfillment, it promises to bring you a sense of peace, but it, it never delivers. And so you think, oh, I just didn't do enough. So we have all those things that build up, I think, particularly again with complex PTSD, if we're coming back to trauma, all the ways that people have developed, they've had to cope with the inability to connect directly with other human beings. And those are really hard to let go of. You know, if I say to you, I mean, I, I was working with a Native American gentleman once, and he was about 40 years old, and he actually had been sober for the longest period of his life, which was five years. And he says, you know, as long as he could remember, he was out in the street in a gutter, drunk. And I said, oh, I'm just wondering if you think you did anything different this time that seems to have increased, you know, your sobriety. And he thought, and he said, yeah. He said, I had to realize that the booze was really giving me something important. It was destroying everything, you know, the, the sort of things that you'll do in your addiction that was not pretty. But he said, I had to accept that the food, that the drug, the addiction was giving me something very, very important. And if I didn't take care of that need and find an alternate way every day, I'll go back. And I talk about that a lot with clients, you know, that these really negative things that you may have done, they were your best ways to deal with something. They're always going to be there. You can't erase them. If you do relapse, it's a sign that those needs that are really important need to be satisfied. And if you don't do it for yourself, the addiction or the dissociation will do it for you. That's so powerful to think about it in that way, because again, yeah, so many of us have rejected that part of ourselves, rejected the need. And I'm hearing you say, if you don't meet that need, the addiction will step in. Yeah, I think so. You know, we have this social fantasy that we all live normal lives. You know, we, you know, we know, we know about ourselves that ninety percent of our thoughts are illegal. Mm -hmm. We know that. You know, mm -hmm. but we're led to believe that everybody else has normal thoughts. Right. And so when we have those, we feel we, we want to die or we want to kill somebody or we want to give up or, you know, all those many things that are particularly enhanced by these negative events. It's denying them that blocks us from integrating them 
and blocks us from having a respectful, curious human relationship, which is the necessary condition for something to become a human resource. So again, I mean, I teach in China a lot, and one of my teaching assistants is this beautiful woman, her name is Lamu, and she is the Tai Chi sword champion of China. She's amazing. Wow. I've seen her give many demonstrations. Wow. I said, Lamu, how did you get into swords? She said, well, it's kind of interesting. I was 10, about 10, and I was in a lot of trouble in school, and I was just like beating up all the kids, especially the boys. And it was a big problem, and I got called into the principal's office, and then he called my dad in, and he said, you know, your daughter is doing all this socially delinquent behavior. We have to kick her out. And dad said, okay, I know what she's doing is unacceptable. It's not okay that she's beating kids up, but let me think about it. And he thought, the force in this one is strong. <laughs> that, that this kid has got really good fighter warrior energy. So he looked into it and he found, you may know, the kind of legendary temple in China, the Shaolin Temple. It's a martial arts temple. And he found that they have a kids program associated with it. He got permission for his daughter to go there. And he said to Lamu, I found this program. You want to go? She said, yes. They took the train down. They walked around. It's pretty hardcore, not, not a lot of frills. And his dad got a little bit unsettled. And he said, Lamu, you don't have to go here. We can go back home. And Mama said, Dad, you told me I could come. I'm staying. And she did for four years. So every day for four years, she got up at four in the morning and did five hours of martial arts and then did her regular schoolwork and so forth. And she's, she's an amazing person. So that beating other kids up, we say, is a not fully humanized core resource. We need this human relational space and psychotherapy conversations are a good one to be able to welcome these parts that are really strong in the person. I want to withdraw. I want to hurt myself. I want to you know, act out and I'm taking it out on my kids. If we want to change those, we need to respect them and welcome them and bring them into a conversation that has a sufficient container that they're also not held rigidly so they can change. It's sort of like they're in a shimmering state, which is to me what trance is for. And then the way that we're representing our ability to be fierce, our ability to say no, our ability to have boundaries can transform into a, a positive version. I think that's a big part of what we're doing. There's so many parts of what you're saying that are jumping out at me. This welcome theme, this, what did you say, that to contain it without holding it too rigidly, how vital that is? Yeah. And probably the more important than the verbal conversation is the nonverbal space in which it's occurring. We know that with our pets. You know, we know that with our kids, mm -hmm. you know, certainly when, you know, if you hold my granddaughter, everybody will realize that, oh, hey, how are you? They realize that mammals feel relationships, what the poet Rumi called the touch of spirit on the body. And when we're in a problem state, or particularly when we're suffering the consequences of trauma, our body has been negatively assaulted in a very violent way. And so we've shut down. And to release, relax the body, it's really quite a challenge. I mean, it's a skill. It's partly, you know, one of the reasons we, we have to have so much training and get paid for it. You know, it's a real skill. But the first skill is finding in yourself as the therapist the centered, open, resonant play that then you can be able to touch client in that sort of centered, resonant 
way. You've got these two sides. If a person feels that you are entering inside of them and doesn't feel safe, they'll shut down. If they don't feel you, they'll never open up. So it's a very delicate balance. And I think that's what opens the container. And that's what opens that resonant space in which images that have been locked can loosen up and, and start to change. Safety looks like this. Anger looks like this. Intimacy looks like this. So we need a safe container where the images are held not too tight, not too loose. Yeah, as you were talking about that, what came up for me in my own work is thinking about self of the therapist or self of the practitioner, like what's going on for us. And if we're not looking at that, taking time to look at our own experience that we're not able to reach for the client to be able to touch them in that way. And then the other part that came up for me is the consent. So if they feel almost an invasion, then there's not, there's not safety there. Yeah. So I think the self of the therapist, the human use of the self of the therapist, the most important thing, particularly where there are boundaries or safety issues. People who have been traumatically violated are uber sensitive about somebody violating their boundaries. They're really, really sensitive. So if you're thinking primarily in terms of technique, I'm supposed to change the person, I'm supposed to cure the client, here we go again, I think, is the client's sense of somebody who's not connected to themselves is trying to get me to do something. And that's the problem, not the solution. You know, I supervise a lot of people and, you know, they say, well, I've got this client, he's got this, you know, this process and what do I do? What do I do? And I say the first thing to do is do nothing. I mean, that's what clients come in. They say, what do I do? What do I do? And it's that sort of anxious attempt to change something in your head that keeps things from changing. So as the client activates their disturbances, their unintegrated experiences, they have to be received in a therapeutic container, which means you have to, in this compassionate, centered, skillful way, be able to welcome them. That's what I believe the client will most deeply be sensing as a first stage in whether the therapeutic relationship is workable. Clients are always testing you. They're always, and they should be. Mm -hmm. Right. They should be saying, is, is it safe to talk about this? There's a lot of those areas, they're carrying a belief. If I talk about this, people will abandon me. People will think I'm crazy. People will, will hurt me if I really share this part of my experience, which is not ready for prime time. And a lot of that conversation is nonverbal. Right. And again, thinking of, you know, how how that sensitivity has been a resource for them to kind of check the temperature of the room. Is this a yeah, safe place for me to, right. to show up? How protective that's been. Always. And so, again, you, you want to help a person learn to use their symptoms or their activation, particularly somatic stuff, anxiety, disconnection, as really important information. And then the question is, is the best way to respond to this need to dissociate? to leave town, to go off into some space. That's what I learned to do. Or is that actually going to make things worse? And in that regard, I often see people and talk with people about what we call the arc of unfolding of a person's life. So the mythologist Joseph Campbell's model of what he called the hero's journey, there's kind of a short version of three steps. I was in the garden. I was innocent. I was like, hi, you know, my five-year-old granddaughter is in the garden. Yeah. And then part of the poignant tragedy of each human life is something happens and you have to exile into the desert. And trauma is, you know, one of the most severe things. And so you don't have the resources to stay present. That's what I say, 
when people originally dissociated, that was the best thing they could have done. But what's really amazing is to interview clients and begin to develop this sense that since the time they had to dissociate, part of them, you know, had to shut down and, and, and go downstairs and into the dark. But another part of them has gone forward in their life and has developed so many interesting resources, you know, different relationships, different skills, different self-management capacities. And I believe after 45 years of working with people that the dissociation starts to break down precisely at the places where people don't need it anymore, where they have the resources that they need in order to integrate and to be able to stay present. They don't know it because as soon as the trigger point activates, they regress. And I don't mean by that you say, well, come on, just stay present. You can handle this now. It's a delicate conversation to help people learn. A lot has happened since they had to dissociate, a lot. And one other point on that, you know, I learned in doing hypnotic work with trauma people that there's a traditional process in hypnotherapy of age regression, which is go back into your childhood. And I found that was, that's probably the worst thing that you can do with trauma survivors. You're asking right. me to go back in the most painful parts of my life? No. So what we look to do is develop and open these resources in the present, to your present age, to your present competency. And when you have a mind-body state where you can feel comfortable in doing that, and that takes some work. Then we ask the material that needs to be integrated to come forward in time and to move from the context where there was no resources and a lot of violent perpetrators to come forward into the present self that a person has worked hard to develop so that when the trauma comes into that place, it can be greeted in an intelligent, skillful, positive way. It can be welcomed. It can be welcomed. That's right. Mm, I'm so appreciating what you're saying, and I, I kind of wish we had, you know, another hour together. I have one more question I would love to ask, if it's okay. Sure. Do you have any kind of experiences or specific stories that can kind of illustrate what you're describing for us? I, I would love to hear if you do. Sure. When you said that, I, I was thinking of... Um, well, when it came to see me, she's about 50 years old, very successful. She did all these women's empowerment groups, and she was really successful. She loved the work. She said, I'm so happy, you know, with my professional life, but I don't have one personal relationship in my life. You know, not, not even a casual, you know, let, let's go out to coffee. And she said, I, I want one. I feel like I'm at a place where I need one and I want one. I said, okay, great. And so, you know, settled down the conversation and I just asked her gently, do you think this has to do with anything? You know, and it's just a general question. She said, yeah. She told a very heart-wrenching story about how her parents were in a sex ring uh, with a fellow pedophile and they would rotate homes and they would bring children into the circle have them disrobe and, and do you know unspeakable things and she and her brother were subject to this for some years so just sort of hanging with that to just feel compassionately feel the pain of that and to sit with it. And then they said, do you remember what you did to try to protect yourself? And she said, yeah. She said, as soon as, and we're talking about repeated trauma and how people anticipate and they start to plan what they're going to do. She said, as soon as I would go into something like that, I would put up in my mind a black wall. 
and I would be behind the black wall. So I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything and they couldn't get to me. And again, that's amazing. That is so extraordinary that that presence inside of you knew that that would be a good thing to do. And I would like to say to that part of you, welcome. I would like to say to that part of you that you are such an honored member of our conversation for really being able to meet those needs for self-protection during your childhood. I, I'd like to ask if that part would be willing to help us to figure out how to explore even better ways to be able to create this protection. Fast forwarding, Heather, in this state, imagine a black wall in front of her and intentionally create the black wall so that she takes over, that she's in charge of the black wall. Mm. And then to imagine, and you know, it's sometimes we do in doing dissociation or trauma work, think of the other, the perpetrator, for example, as a very, very small image all the way over across the room on the wall. You bring it down to some manageable size. And to have that black wall, and then I'd like to ask that part of you to experiment with different types of opacity, different types of ways of creating that wall so that you can bring the protection and then see if you can let anything in through the protection wall. And this was something we did over a number of sessions. And so she learned how to create this wall so it varied from black to translucent. You know, they're kind of like, I, I still have in my home here these glass blocks mm -hmm. that you have like going outside and you can have various levels of you can't really see through. So she learned to do that and to notice and to let that part of her teach her how much she needed to create an opaque wall and how much translucency was possible for her in terms of beginning to connect with other people. Once we had that, then we started adding which other people might you want to connect with and to use her state as a sort of a guide of how much, how long can we do this for? Because you can do it as long as your organism stays open. Since your organism closed, great. Thank you so much for teaching me. Mm -hmm. That's enough. That's enough. Mm -hmm. That's enough. Mm -hmm. So Honoring that boundary. Yeah. So that, you know, she would say that black wall or that inability to have social relationship as a adult was sort of using that resource that she created as a child in a severe trauma situation. And then she joins it and welcomes it and learns to modulate it. And as Erickson used to say, to meet the needs and the competencies of your present self. Mm. That's so beautifully adaptive. And I'm just kind of holding, you know, how that was like such a collaborative experience to, to kind of collaborate with that part of her that needed to protect and so beautifully, you know, adapted to. Yeah the situation to protect her and to bring that part forward into the present moment and really utilize her agency to kind of activate that part of her. Yeah. How important and vital. Those are really what I learned from Milton Erickson, this collaborative sense that just from the point of view, if you want any sort of sustainable therapeutic change, probably the majority of language and images has to come from the client. Yeah. You know, so that's why I say I, I don't use the term hypnosis because people think booga booga, oh, you're telling somebody what to do. And I say, no, that's mm -hmm. the problem, not yeah. the solution. That's like objectifying. Yeah. Yeah. And, and saying, I mean, even if you were right, this is what you should do, it wouldn't work because the person has to feel that this is my way. This is my way. That's the only way that people can feel comfortable in the world as they know that this is coming from me. This is my choice. These are my values. Thank you so much for sharing all yeah, of this that you've learned. Welcome. I know it's just the tip of the iceberg of what you... Just the tip of the iceberg. The work that you're yeah. putting into the world. So I wonder if we could share with listeners 
How can we find you? How can we access your work? I know you have a website. We'll certainly put that in the show notes. That's really the the best way is www.stephengilligan.com. And uh, I think you'll find that as an entryway into whatever you, you might find it interesting about the work. Wonderful. And I know you have some books. Can you share with us if they want to search you up? <laughs> yeah, well, the books are listed on the website, but I've got eight books that I've written, two more coming out from therapeutic trances to something called The Courage to Love, but something called The Legacy of Erickson, something called The Hero's Journey. These are all books that talk about creativity as as the core dynamic of every human being. We create our reality. And so what does it mean to align with that creative river that's coming from who knows where and be able to learn how to skillfully join it and, and open it in a way that you can bring, you know, you, it can make your life happy and you can make a contribution to others. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, my heart is just feeling really full for the work that you're putting into the world and, and what you've shared with our community, our listeners today, and really appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest and their work, check the show notes or visit us at narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. Are you interested in deepening your understanding of NARM? We're excited to present the Inner Circle, NARM's online learning community. Each month, members receive direct mentorship from NARM creator, Dr. Lawrence Heller and NARM training director, Brad Kammer, access to NARM demonstrations with extensive debriefs and the opportunity to engage with the hub for the international NARM community. Dive in with a free 14-day trial and access the three-month archive by visiting www.narmtraining.com forward slash free trial. Thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community, connection with you, and changing the world by transforming trauma. Mm -hmm.